there are some forest ecosystems across the United States and world that actually occasionally need a fire to regenerate and thrive. And today I'm gonna to prove it to you by lighting this forest on fire. Now, of course, that's a joke. I'm not actually going to do that. But it is true that there are some forest ecosystems that do have fire as a part of their natural ecology, and the trees are adapted to those fire regimes. Now, today I'm in the cloud forest of Oaxaca, Mexico, and this ecosystem is used to the occasional fire, and so fire has been a factor in the evolution of many of the species around me. So I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to demonstrate what I believe to be one of the most amazing and miraculous evolutionary adaptations of trees, and that would be serotonous cones. Now, here is a serotonous cone that I just picked up off the ground. This is from the species, I believe, Pinus patula, or patula, and uh, it looks quite a bit different than a lot of the pine cones that you see in the United States. Uh, specifically, you know, white pine and red pine, those kind of have open little scales, and they have that traditional pine cone look. This one almost looks like, I don't know, a green pine cone, a pine cone that hasn't opened yet. And that's because it hasn't. It is very tightly guarded and the scales are very thick and you cannot open it easily. I cannot even break this very easily. That's because this cone is serotonous. Now, literally speaking in botany, serotonous just means that it is delayed. There is a delayed release of these seeds. But more pertinently, it usually means that these seeds are actually released with the help of fire. And there's a very particular reason for that. But before we get more into the strategy of serotony and why it exists, why these seeds are only released during a fire or um, other heating event, and why I believe it really is just one of the coolest adaptations that trees have and why I think trees are just such fascinating organisms, um, before we discuss that, I'm going to demonstrate this for you. So we're going to actually simulate a forest fire by burning one of these pine cones. All right, so we're gonna put this pine cone, this serotonous pine cone over an open flame, and we're going to see what happens. not done yet. I'm going to stop it for a little bit though because I want you to hear something. Hopefully that picks up, but can you hear that sizzling? That's, that's all the resin inside cooking, right? So there's a lot of resin inside that's melting and it's starting to release those scales as you can probably see. Let's uh, keep cooking it for a little bit longer. All right, so let's take a look at this. Oof, it's still pretty hot, but that will do. So, pine cone has changed. If you've noticed the shape of the pine cone, it's a bit more charred, you know, a bit more ashy, but the shape more closely resembles now maybe a white pine cone. Those scales are starting to bend outward. On the side that wasn't exposed to fire, we still have that plated armadillo-like look. But here, you know, this is more of a familiar pine cone, just like I said, with more char. And so with exposure to the fire, the resin inside melted and has allowed those seeds to release. Now you might be thinking how those seeds could possibly remain viable after being cooked over a mix of butane and propane for several minutes. And well, you know, let's see how the seeds fared. I'm gonna try to open this up and grab one. So it's actually still hard, like this thing could have been cooked for longer because those seeds are still in there quite a ways and I'm afraid I'm gonna, if I drop one, I'm not gonna be able to find it on the dirt. So I'm gonna take my time here. All right, so I had to dig around for a while and uh, I kept dropping them. But this is one of the seeds that was released from burning the cone. And if you can see, I mean, there's, <laughs> it's kind of black now because I've been touching it and you know, my hands are all ashy. 
but there was no char on the inside of the pine cone. It wasn't hot to the touch. In fact, the very center was still cold. Uh, these pine cones have an amazing amount of protection and insulation. They can withstand burning for quite some time and still have viable seeds. So that's pretty neat. So that's how these things work. Now the question is, why is that so cool? Why do I think this is just a miraculous adaptation? And I think part of the reason I think this is so cool is because I have a lot of experience in planting spruce in northern Maine. And one of the things about planting spruce is that it's very hard to grow it because within the first few years, you know, you clear cut a stand, you plant the spruce, and within a few years, the stand is just inundated with early successional vegetation. So that essentially means grasses, weeds, uh, in some cases, early successional trees like aspen. It's very difficult to cultivate a spot where this tree can grow freely without competition. And so we resort to the use of herbicides. We spray stands of planted spruce once, maybe two times, in order to ensure that there's no competition and that these trees can grow freely. And so what is a man-made invention, herbicide, uh, reflects something that is kind of a universal truth, which is that when a stand is opened up, there's more sunlight, there's more resources, there's going to be a lot of competition. So what does this cone represent? This cone is an opportunistic release mechanism for a natural herbicide. So think about a forest fire. A forest fire sweeps through. It kills all the ground vegetation. Some trees persist, but it's killing a lot of vegetation. There's no competition. A fire is just essentially a natural herbicide. And so this tree has adapted to release its seeds when there's such an event that makes it opportunistic to grow. Now what's even cooler is that this mechanism is not strictly adapted to a fire regime. As I stated previously, I am currently in a cloud forest. And a cloud forest is essentially a high elevation rainforest. I am literally in a cloud right now. And in fact, I've tried to film this two or three times and each time I've had to stop because it started pouring rain. And even right now, I can hear some thunder in the distance. So even though technically speaking, I'm in a dry semi-arid region, this area wouldn't burn as often as you would think. Although there is still a dry season and it does still burn, I assure you, especially with how, how steep the slopes are. But no, this cone doesn't strictly need fire to release. All it needs is heat. And where does heat come from? Heat comes from the sun. So that means that this cone can respond to any sort of opening in the canopy, especially in the hot Mexican sun. So if there's a mortality event, if um, a tree falls down, something like that, and it creates a spot on the forest floor where the sun is beaming down on these dropped cones, over time, it might take a little bit, but over time, these cones will release. And in fact, I've had this cone in my house for a little bit and it's already starting to open up a little bit compared to when I picked it up on the forest floor. So in that situation, it's still kind of doing the same thing. It is only releasing when it senses that there is a lack of competition. And the best signal for a lack of competition is heat, either by fire in the sense of, you know, that natural herbicide event, or through just open sunlight, which just means that there's nothing growing around you. So, you know, in northern Maine, what tends to happen is you can go in a dense forest canopy and there's always regeneration sprouting up. Sugar maple especially. You can go into a sugar maple stand and it's just carpeted with sugar maple. But what happens is that these sugar maple seedlings never persist. They always die off because there just aren't enough resources for them to thrive. Here, it's kind of similar, but the opposite. You can go into a dense stand and the understory is just completely barren. There's almost nothing. And in fact, I did a video last week that was in one such stand and you can see there's really nothing around me. But as soon as you go to an area where there is an opening in the canopy, suddenly it's surrounded by regeneration. And that's exactly why is there's enough sunlight for these things to heat up and release their seeds. But it goes beyond just the reproductive strategy of the trees. There's another really cool benefit um, so in silviculture and botany, there's kind of a trade-off between developing seeds, developing fruit, and stem growth. So as you can imagine, it requires a lot of energy to grow something like this, especially when, you know, there are hundreds on the tree. 
And there's also a biological impetus for the tree to keep growing, you know, because it does have to contend with competition. And so it has to keep growing upwards to try to get as much sun as possible. So there's kind of a trade-off between having a strategy to spread your genes to reproduce and to persist, to thrive, to grow. So what a lot of trees, if not every tree ends up doing is there's one year where they might put on a lot of diameter growth, a lot of stem growth, a lot of root growth, and another year where they have more seed production, we call those mast years. Uh, so even with you know apple trees, apples, as you can imagine, they're surrounded by sugar. They're incredibly energy intensive, which is probably why apple trees don't grow very large. But even then, there are some years that produce more apples than others. Sometimes it's because of weather, of course, but also it's just about the tree's natural metabolism. So going back to northern Maine for a second, uh, there is really no mechanism in the natural environment to tell trees when's the best time to spread their seed. Like, yeah, the, it does get hot, but only for about, you know, a month out of the year. Uh, so serotony doesn't really work all that well. So the result is that those spruces and balsam firs have to produce their seed every two years because the seeds don't really remain viable for too long. So the hope is that if they just keep producing seeds, eventually that production will match up with the time period in a place where it's opportunistic to spread regeneration. And of course, there are other mechanisms to do that. You know, like even these seeds, they have a Samara, which means they can spread in the wind and so forth. But ultimately it, it has to produce seed as much as possible in order to have the best chances of spreading. These trees, the Mexican weeping pine, Pinus patula, they produce seed only about every five to seven years. And you know, they'll remain on the branches of the trees, they'll remain on the forest floor, and they'll just sit there waiting for the right time to release. And so what that means is the tree can produce seed with more, I'll call it temporal efficiency. It doesn't have to produce them as frequently, they can just sit on the tree or on the forest floor and wait for the best time to release. That is really cool. That means that the tree doesn't have to focus as much on making seeds and can allocate more resources towards growing and doing what trees do best, you know, just hanging out in the sun, growing taller. And yes, in fact, the Mexican weeping pine, named after its uh, drooping needles, as you can kind of see here, it's an incredibly fast growing and important species of timber, not just here in Mexico, not just in the Sierra Madre, but all over the world. This is actually a very prominent species of commercial timber grown in plantations in um, Africa, and they even have some in New Zealand. And in fact, in some parts of the world, it's considered invasive because it's so well adapted to those um, fire regimes or uh, periodic disturbance regimes and so forth. So anyway, I thought it'd be great to share that with you guys, if only because there are serotonin species in the United States and it's an important function to understand, but also because I want you to appreciate how amazing trees and their ecosystems can really be. You know, in ecology circles, there's something I like to call the avatar effect. And if you remember the movie Avatar from like 2009, there was a whole thing where they were discovering that the trees on this new planet were talking to each other through these like neural networks underground. And if you talk to enough, you know, people who are into like environmental science or like, you know, ecology students or whatever, uh, they'll, they'll bring up uh, fungal connections in the soil and they will imply that there exists these connections on Earth. And maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I haven't really done a whole lot of research on it, to be honest. But I do think it's overstated. And the reason it's overstated is because people like to speculate on things that aren't fully understood. But in fact, I think the real miracles of the forest are right in front of us. They're things that are well understood, well known, and we just don't really appreciate them. Now, my, and my favorite example of this is actually in thinning. When we thin, you know, we're reducing the density of the stand and we're changing the tree's external environment. And the tree can respond to this change in environment because it will have to respond to the change in threats that it faces. And how does it know how to respond to these threats? It doesn't have a central nervous system. It's not responding to anything but an increase in energy and it's allocating its carbohydrates in such a way that it is best able to defend itself against the threats present in its external environment based on the amount of energy it receives. It's really cool. Now, if you wanna learn more about that, I do actually have a silviculture course that talks more 
about those sorts of dynamics, I'm going to leave a link in the description and in the comments. But also, uh, if you just want to learn more about forest management, of course, this is a forest management channel. I have a free ebook that you can get off of my website. I'm going to leave a link to that in the description and comments as well. So go and give that a look if you want to learn more about the forest, more about thinning and changing its external environments, and how you can manage your forest without setting it on fire. Unless you want to, because prescribed burns are a legitimate means of managing a forest. But disclaimer, contact your authorities and know what you're doing. All right, so that's all for today. I'm going to return this pine cone to the forest, and uh, I will see you later.